Can you help me, please? I'm stuck. I don't, I don't think that's a good idea. I have zero experience in lumberjacking. Thank God you're here. Can you make some food? I've been stuck here for six days, and all I've had to eat are two pine cones. Well, I'm not a nutritionist, so I wouldn't know what someone in your condition would... Do something! I, do what? I'm, I'm not a zoologist. There's a gun in the tent. Get the gun. I don't have a license. I've never operated... Uh, Look, just through a rock or something. I'm not a geologist. I don't know which one would be most effective. Oh, I, I don't want to die. I don't even know if I'll get into heaven. Do you at least know how to get into heaven? Well, actually, I'm a Christian, but I'm not a theologian, so I wouldn't really know what to say to you. But, you know, if you ever get out of here, you really should look into it. Oh, he's coming! Run! But I have no formal training in long distance running. <sighs> There's a parable that's told of a community of ducks. One day, the community of ducks all waddled up to Duck Church one Sunday to hear the duck preacher. After they waddled into the church building, the service began. The duck preacher began to speak eloquently on how God had given the ducks wings so they could fly. He pounded the pulpit with his beak, and he began to say, with these wings... There's nothing that ducks cannot do. There is no God-given tasks that we cannot accomplish. With these wings, we will no longer have to walk through life, and we can soar high into the sky. Shouts of amen were quacked throughout the duck congregation, and the duck preacher concluded his message, exclaiming one more time, with our wings, we can fly through life. We can fly. And more ducks quacked loud amens in response. Every duck loved the service. In fact, all the ducks that were present commented on how wonderfully convicting the message was they heard from the duck preacher. And then they left church and waddled all the way home. You know, a church really is described in the Bible as a church that will one day fly. <laughs> it will meet the Lord in the air. And the truth is, is that when we're worshiping the Lord, it is kind of like flying. We're flying into the heavenlies and we're meeting with our God and we're worshiping him and we're, and we're connecting to him with our lives. And the fact is our lives should be sh so changed that the world will see it, they will hear about it, and they want to know where we go to church, where we assemble. And so as we talk about uncommon community in this series, as we finish the second part of this message from Hebrews chapter 10. I'd like us to begin by reading that section again, um, verses 19 through 25, because this message is entitled Uncommon Community is about one another. It's about one another, and, and that's why it's so unique in all the world. It's, it's different. It's, it's an uncommon thing, and that's why we have to really understand it, appreciate it, and live it out the way it was meant to be lived. And so let's look at our text today, Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 19. And here's what it says. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more, as you see the day drawing near. Let's pray. God, I thank you for bringing us together to assemble in this place. For the purpose of meeting around your son's table on the first day of the week. To celebrate the resurrection of your son. The one whom we owe our salvation and our daily hope. And Father, I pray today as we continue to understand and, and greatly appreciate the uncommon community that is the kingdom of God, that is the church, 
that we will draw near, Lord, together as one and be used by you as a big city on a hill. The light shining in darkness, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our proposition for this message has been the Christian community, uh, our responsibility is one another. It's an uncommon community whose responsibility is one another. And so we talked about last week that we are our brother's keeper. I want to remind you those very quickly, those first three points that we covered last week. And that is, um, first, we had to learn that we need to draw near with one another. That's what the text says. Let us draw near with sincere heart and full assurance of faith. Knowing that as we draw near to the Lord, it, naturally, we will draw near to one another. God is that uniting force. In fact, we are told to, to uh, preserve um, the, the, the unity through the spirit in the bond of peace. We're called to that, and God is our uniting factor. No matter our background, no matter our differences in age or socioeconomic background, there's one uniting factor that brings people together in the kingdom of God of every tongue and tribe and nation, and that is the spirit of God, God himself. And so we draw near together with one another to the holy God. The second thing we learned is that we need to hold fast with one another. And that's what the text says. Again, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. We need to be steadfast. We need to hold on and, and, and be a tight-knit group to persevere through the difficulties that life brings, the challenges that being a spiritual community brings. We need to persevere and hold fast to all those things and a yes to the, uh, to the confession that brings our hope in Christ. And then we finished last week with the third point, which is to stimulate one another. And it says specifically in this context to stimulate one another together in this community toward love and good deeds. And so, uh, as, I, as I told you, that word stimulate means to cause a reaction in someone else. And so our presence together should be causing one another to become more righteous, to draw closer towards righteousness, specifically towards love and good deeds. And so it's an uncommon community. It's not like any other community in all the world. Probably the closest one you'll ever find is a very healthy, functional family because the church is a healthy, is to be a healthy, functioning family. It was designed to be that way, just like a physical blood family was meant to be that way. We are the, the, uh, the uh, community bond together with the blood of Christ, not physical blood. And so even greater do we come together. So let's move on now to uh, the fourth point of this message, that is, we are called to assemble with one another. That's what verse 25 says, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some. There's a, there's a confession made there, isn't there? There's an acknowledgement that some people are in the habit of forsaking of the coming together, the assembling together. But we are not to be that way. Now, when the kids were very young, we had all three of them at the time and Chris, of course, was quite a bit older. He was probably about nine, and that makes Daniel about five, and Noah about two and a half. And we went in with Tracy's parents and bought one of those Power Wheel Jeep Wranglers. You know what I'm talking about, the little electric Jeeps that you put together and the kids drive around. It was, it was perfect for them to come together and drive around the backyard when we lived in Florida. And uh, I remember very vividly, and, and when we got this, because um, they, you know, the parents sent down the check, and so we kind of bought it last minute, and uh, I, uh, earlier that day on Christmas Eve, I'd opened up the box and looked at the directions, and it said, uh, on the box, actually, it said, some assembly required. And I thought, well, you know, it's to be expected. And I looked at the uh, directions, and it said, uh, you know, some assembly required approximately 90-minute assembly time. And I thought... This would be no big deal. I mean, I used to be in biomedical engineering. I'll whip this thing out in about 45 minutes. And so uh, it was actually no longer Christmas Eve when I actually got to it. It was actually in the wee hours of Christmas Day. I said, well, it's time to put the power wheels together. And uh, so I got that out. I said, well, let me go ahead and get this done. Well, three and a half hours later, with several parts that I never did figure out where they actually went, I had something that resembled the picture in the box. And see, what I failed to appreciate is how much assembly was required. <laughs> I, I underestimated it, you know? And I, I think 
that's a good illustration of how many Christians think. They underestimate how much assembly is required, uh, how much is actually necessary as a Christian. Here, uh, the truth is, as the church, we need to realize that some assembly is required. And, and the key word there being required, as, it, as our text points out, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some. Here's the truth. You and I and the church as a group need one another. We need the assembly. We need to come together. I want you to just imagine for a minute. This is how I picture it. Um, I, I like sports. And I, uh, one of the sports I like to watch is boxing. And I just the analogy I thought of. Can you imagine that here are two men? They are in combat for 12 rounds. And I want you to imagine, here it is, the 11th round. And it's been a brutal fight. They've been going toe to toe, back and forth. It's almost tied evenly. Can you imagine that you're the guy and you're just slightly behind on points at the end of the 11th round? You got one round to redeem yourself. You got to either knock this guy out or somehow do something so amazing to catch up and to actually win this fight. And so when the bell rings at the end of the 11th round, you go to your corner. You go to the corner to get your encouragement, to get your coaching, to get your, your wounds um, iced. And you go there, and the trainer's not there. You say, where's the trainer? Oh, he went out to get some popcorn. He'll be back in, in about two minutes. Well, you only got 90 seconds in the corner here. <laughs> and your trainer's not there. And so now you have to go on this all by yourself. The person that was meant to encourage you is not there. Can you imagine what that would be like? Well, I bet some of you can. I bet some of you have been kicked around and bloodied by life. Some of you have been stressed and pushed to your limit. And you've come to your corner, your safe haven, your place of encouragement, your place uh, where they, you can build you up again and bind your wounds, something that we call the church. And you come here, and the one that was meant to encourage you is not there. The truth is, the reason why we need to assemble, and some assembly is required, my dear brothers and sisters, is not just so you can be encouraged, although certainly that's part of the, 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 the part. Um, that's part of it. But also you come to encourage others. That's the mandate. That's the need that you serve when you come here. You've got to assemble to encourage and be encouraged. You see, the world tells you it's about the individual, not the group. And the truth is, in a spiritual realm, it's a spiritual community that has your back. You ever heard this song? Maybe you ever, have you ever sang the song before? Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrow. Well, my dear friends, if nobody knows the trouble you've seen, whose fault is that? <laughs> because you've not told anybody. Because the truth is, the, the one true God who does see everything uses the church as a means of encouragement, as a means of direction as a, mean of, a means of building one another up, of weeping with one another and rejoicing with one another. That's what the church community is supposed to be. And so the assembly, the coming together, not just the first day of the week, but notice he doesn't even mention specifically the first day of the week, although if you keep reading, he mentions some things that relate to the first day of the week, namely the Lord's Supper or the blood of the covenant. You'll have to keep reading yourself. But he just says in general, the assembling together. And we're not to forsake that assembly as is in the habit of some. You see, we need uh, people in our life. And God puts people in our life. It's meant to put people in our life. Someone who can listen. Someone who has an answer. Somebody who can be a resource to us. Someone who we need to assemble so we can be that community of love where the wounds are banded and the heartbroken are cared for and where the broken find wholeness and where the lost discover salvation. Brothers and sisters, we as a church are here for the least, the last, the lost, and the lonely. And if you don't know who that is, look around or break out a mirror because that's what we are when it comes to the world. But the truth is in Christ, we have that hope and we need to be encouraging one another. Some assembly 
is required. I really do think the closest thing that we have in our individual families that maybe we've lost over the years, that's close to be like the assembly, is kind of the, what used to be the nightly dinner meal around the table. And I know it kind of in our modern society, we've kind of lost that. And even now, even, though my, now, even now that my family has gotten older, we don't do that as much anymore. My wife and I eat together, that's, that's about it. And the kids are, of course, only one of them lives with us now, and, and uh, so we don't have as much. But I remember when the kids were growing up, that was such an important time. We got to reconnect with one another. We, we got to discuss the things that were going on in our lives all around that table. That was a great daily assembly that we look forward to. But can you imagine if one of my kids just all of a sudden dropped out and never showed up to dinner again and never sent me um, a, a text even saying, hey, I'm not going to be there. Can you imagine how destructive that would be to that personal time that our family is? And I want you to realize that when we miss the assembly, that you're not just the one missing, you are being missed. Your presence is being missed. Your opportunity to be encouraged and encourage is being missed. And that's why the Lord, in his wisdom, knows that we need to come together and assemble together. Being steadfast in assembly with one another is not the habit of some, is what he says there. And I think we've got to come clean about this. We've got to be honest that we don't. You know, our dear brother, he read today... Um, about the first day of the week when those ladies came to the tomb. Can you imagine the excitement they had when the tomb was empty and an angel was there to proclaim what had happened? The reason why we assemble on the first day of the week, the reason why our Lord had us assemble on the first day of the week to break bread, because that is the day of the resurrection. It's the celebration of the resurrection. Can we have the same kind of enthusiasm and excitement that must have existed in that first, if you will, church service in a way, when they came and gathered there and heard that their Savior was not dead, that he was not in the tomb, but he was alive? It might shock you to know that sometimes people text me on a Sunday morning and said how excited they are to assemble with the church. And that's great. But I wonder why more of us are not excited about it. Why we don't look forward to it like we look at it as a, a hurdle to the rest of our day or even sometimes a hurdle to the rest of our week. Or we look at it as an endurance co uh, uh, contest, you know, see how we can endure. Or we look at it as a, a time that we don't have to feel guilty if we skip it. It's got to be more than that, friends. Our assembly, you get out of it what you put into it. Let me just share that with you. If you're not getting things out of our assembly, it's because you're not putting things into the assembly. It's meant to be that way. It's a give and a take. Don't forsake the assembly. I'm going to tell you a story about a young Christian woman that I know. A true story about her when she was in high school. This is many years ago. In fact, it's been almost 20 years now, which means she's pretty old now compared to when, she, when this happened. She was a senior in high school, beautiful young girl, inside and out. One thing she was really good at was cheerleading. She was a great cheerleader. And she loved to cheerlead. In her senior year, they got a new cheerleading coach. And sometimes, my dear friends, when you are on fire for the Lord and you live a life as she did, Obviously, where God was the priority, you need to know people will, be, will oppose you. When you try to put God first, people will oppose you. And yes, it's not just the people, but it's the evil forces behind them. But God, I mean, Satan uses people just like God uses people. Try to discourage you and destroy you. And this particular new cheerleading coach did not like Christians. And she could not stand this young woman because this young woman, Christ would show, shine through her brightly. And when she signed up every year for the cheerleading team, she had always made it clear that she could never participate on anything that happened on a Sunday. 
And every year it was always said, there's no problem, we don't do anything on Sundays anyway. And so it was for her senior year. But again, this cheerleading coach, she could just not stand having that girl around. She thought, I'm going I'm to get her. And so there was this new competition that she thought, the coach thought she would sign up for. And uh, guess what? It happened to be on a Sunday. And so she decided, well, this is you know, a new competition. We want to have a good showing here. And so I'm making this a mandatory participation. And after she announced that, after one practice, one evening, this young woman went to go see the coach and said, you know, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I mentioned at the beginning of the year that I could not commit to anything on Sunday. And the coach, no doubt, thought to herself, I got her now. And she said, well, this is a mandatory participation. Either you come and participate or you're off the team. She said, well, I'm sorry to say, I guess I'm off the team because you have to understand something. I'm not a cheerleader who happens to be a Christian. I am a Christian who just happens to cheerlead. And my dear friends, we have to have that kind of enthusiasm and dedication that we let our light shine and be clear whose side we're on when it comes to our priorities. Some assembly is required. And so the writer here in Hebrews is encouraging us, draw near, hold fast, stimulate one another to love and good deeds, assemble with one another, and then finally, encourage one another. Look at verse 25. Not forsaking our own assembling together is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, I know we talked a bit about already encouraging because it's kind of intertwined with the assembly, but I thought I, I could not emphasize that enough of one of the main points. Yes, See, you see, I want you to think about this. A lot of times people don't prioritize the assembling together because, well, I can worship God anywhere. And that is 100% true. You don't have to be in this building to worship the Lord because you're, if you are a child of God, God lives in you by his spirit. So you're always in the presence of God. So it's not a matter of this is the only place you can worship. But God calls us together in assembly around the Lord's table for a purpose, because number one, he knows that we need it. We need to be here. And so he's not just making you jump through a hoop by coming here and setting time out of your uh, Sunday to come here in this place. He knows that you and I need to be in this place together. And even as we assemble together on a daily basis, even. The Bible tells us there's one clear reason to meet together, and that is to encourage one another. Because while you can worship somewhere else, you can't encourage one another if you're not with the body of Christ. The emphasis is not what you get out of the assembly, it, rather it's what you can contribute to it. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had in the last 25 years talking to people and encouraging them to be there, and they often say, well, I just don't get anything out of it. And it's so clear you don't get anything out of it. Number one, that's not the point. Number two, you're not getting anything out of it because you're not putting anything into it. There's a universal law that the Bible talks about. One place it's written is Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he shall reap also. There's a lot of people trying to reap <laughs> without sowing. How many of you have gardens out here? Anybody got a garden? Good. Thanks, thanks Angie. <laughs> hey, <I'm, laughs> you bunch of city slickers, come on. <laughs> now, Angie, did you plant any seeds in the garden? Or did you plant any, any babies in the garden? <laughs> what are those things called? <laughs> did you put any plants in the garden? <laughs> okay, so you sowed something in the garden. So you're not, you're not just going to a patch of ground waiting for it to yield something for you. Okay. So you sowed, then you expect to reap. That's a, that's a reasonable expectation, okay? Now, we would think Angie was a few fries short of a Happy Meal if she went there trying to pick tomatoes in a place where she never planted any tomatoes, right? But we know she's not that way because she told us she put some tomato plants in there. But I want you to realize some of you are trying to pick tomatoes you didn't plant none. Some of you are trying to reap some fruit where you've not cast any seed. And I'm encouraging you, my dear friends, you come to give and watch yourself receive. It's not about self, ultimately, it's about others. 
When Jesus left the majesty of heaven to come to the earth, it was not for his benefit, but for my benefit and your benefit. He did that. And that's the, the precedent he set for us. When we come to church, we should be thinking about someone else. You know, when I was a science teacher, I, one of the cool things I discovered and would teach about in biology class when we were uh, studying, um, studying about trees, I learned that in some forest, even though the forest might be made up of many different species of trees, that there in a forest is often an interconnectedness of the root system. So even though you might have one kind of tree over here and other kinds of tree over here, they're still, they learn to interconnect their roots. And it's an amazing thing that an entire forest might be interconnected. And the purpose of that is, the benefit of that is, well, if there's a water source on one side of the forest, it can help feed the other side of the forest. If part of the forest has better access to sunlight, well, the things that it makes, the glucose that it makes and some of the, the energy uh, that it makes from those, uh, through, through photosynthesis, it can help share with other parts because it's, those things are stored in the root system. And I thought, you know, that that's really how God intended us to be. When one person is struggling, then the ones that are strong at the moment come and help you out. And then when you're struggling, someone helps you. That's, how, that's the beautiful picture of what it's supposed to be. But if we don't assemble, if we don't ever connect together, if we don't ever lock roots together, then that's never going to happen. We often think, well, it won't hurt me if I miss assembly. I know people think that way. They've told me that. Well, it's not going to hurt me if I miss one Sunday. Well, first of all, I don't believe it. <laughs> I don't think that's true because I think God says otherwise. Number two, that's not really supposed to be your primary consideration. It's all about who you will hurt, not whether it will hurt you, but who you will hurt if you're not there. Because maybe you are the one that God was going to use to encourage someone that was going to put in your path, and you had the necessary gifts, necessary experiences, uh, necessary words to share with that person, and now you're not here to do it. The number one person, a reason why I think people miss church is because they think, it's okay, I'm strong, I don't need it. Has that thought ever entered your mind? If that's the case, you're probably not as mature as you think you are. Here's my illustration for that. Can you imagine for a minute if Christmas was only celebrated by kindergartners? I want you to think about this for a minute. Christmas is only celebrated by kindergartners. How many gifts are going to be given during Christmas by kindergartners? Because when you're a little kid, you're in receive mode, aren't you? <laughs> Right? Most people are in receive mode. And so only works with the mature people there. The adults there are giving, the children are receiving. But if all there is is children, all y'all do is sit in a circle looking at each other on Christmas morning. <laughs> right? There's no giving. So my point is, if you're not in the mode of giving, you're probably not as mature as you think you are. You're in receiving mode, and that's how you think about it. And you think, well, I'm not going to get anything out of it, or I'm strong enough, I don't need to get anything out of it. And really, you're fooling yourself. The Bible says this is not what we're going to do when we gather as a church. If, if, every, if everyone comes only to get something for themselves, we will not likely uh, go away. We'll most likely go away disappointed. But if we all come together, in other words, if we all come together to get, we're just going to be staring around looking at one another. But if we come all together to give, when we come together, we'll all receive. We come together to encourage and be encouraged. If we come to build up one another, we will all be edified. Stories told about an old man that every Sunday, even though he was deaf, and everyone in the community knew he was deaf, Every Sunday morning, he could be seen walking to church. And then one time, one of his neighbors, who was definitely not a churchgoer, had a little interest in Christianity, knew his neighbor and had a decent relationship with him. They were decent neighbors. And week after week, he would see the neighbor get up early Sunday morning and go to assembly. One time, he just couldn't contain his curiosity anymore. And he said to the man, he said, why in the world do you go to church on Sunday mornings? You can't hear the songs. You can't hear the preaching. So why do you go? 
And this is what he said. I want my neighbors, I want my church family, and I want God to know whose side I'm on. <laughs> In other words, he went there to make a statement. I, I like the King James Version in, in Hebrews, I mean, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul's recounting there, he says, when you take the body and blood of the Lord, you do show forth the Lord's death until he comes. I like to think about that as your participation in the Lord's Supper. When you, when you do show forth the Lord's death until he comes, it's like you're preaching a sermon. Your faithfulness to the Lord and the covenant of the Lord and the table of the Lord is preaching a sermon. Maybe to those who are struggling of faithfulness and priority. See, the church is like a body, and that's what Paul compares it to in 1 Corinthians 12. He says, we are so closely connected that when one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Have we come to that stage? Have we come to that stage when we're suffering with one another and rejoicing with one another the way we should? And you say, well, we're doing it a pretty good job. Well, let me ask you, if your car didn't start one time out of every 10, would you call that a good vehicle? If your newspaper boy delivered to your house Pretty faithfully, but he missed a day or two every month. Would that be okay with you, or would you be on the phone? <laughs> if you didn't show up to work two or three times a month, would your boss think you're faithful? If your refrigerator quit a day and now, uh, uh, now and then, would you excuse it and say, well, it works most of the time. It's pretty good. If your water heater gave you cold water one or two days a month, would you be okay with that? See, my friends, if you miss worship and attend meetings only often enough to show you're interested, but not enough to encourage your brethren, do you really think that's being faithful? Do you think that's something the Lord would call faithful? That we should be, that he would be pleased with that? And so I'm going to leave you with this thought this morning. Huntington Christian Church must be the community, the uncommon community, God is calling us to be. We need to draw near with one another, hold fast with one another, stimulate one another, encourage one another, assemble with one another. No compromise, no holding back, no excuses. No more tolerance for anything less than 100%. That's what God gave us. And that's what he deserves from us, to do our very best for him. Because again, I shared with this with you last week, the punchline is this. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, he says there, there remains no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. To me, it's the saddest thing in the world to see how most people spend their time and energy on meaningless, meaningless things. And God's kind of cast aside. You know, it seems like the one who's supposed to be the all in all almost seems like he's nothing at all to too many people. It's sad indeed knowing that God has set mankind in a race, a race that will ultimately end up in heaven or hell. That's, that's the stakes of the race that we're running. At the finish line is either heaven or hell, and we treat it as something that we're barely interested in. Oh, how we should marvel at the madness and lament their self-delusion. That they think that they can run a race like that and win. If God has never told them what they were set into the world to do, or what they're supposed to do as Christians on the earth, and I guess we could give an excuse to them, couldn't we? <laughs> you know, if, if God never told us, what we're supposed to do down here, and we're just trying to figure out on our own, then we really couldn't fault anyone for not following the righteous path if God has not clearly defined it. But I don't think anyone can, can say in good faith today that God has not clearly defined what he's calling us to do and, and the way he's calling us to live. And so I'm asking, as we, as we go throughout this series on the uncommon community, and we just started off this this whole thing these last two weeks talking about really how uncommon it is. And I know it's different and it's probably no doubt unlike anything else in your life. 
as we talk about what the Bible actually says and how we are to interact with one another. I pray that you genuinely will hide these things in your heart and strive because, again, if we're coming clean in 2018, we have to realize that we have work to do as a spiritual community, don't we? We can do better. I can do better. You can do better. We can all do better. But you'll be amazed at the results. Just a little bit of effort. You know, I think I said uh, recently, a righteous person is the easiest person in the world to encourage. I mean, it's true. I find it to be very true. I can still remember just a handful, a few times, people gave me encouraging words, and it had been, been many times, but I can just remember a very few instances where it was just a little tiny bit of encouragement, but it made such a dramatic change in my walk with Christ. Because at that particular moment, for whatever reason, that person came up and talked to me, and it even happened to me this week, actually. When I thought, man, I, just, I felt like quitting, I feel like giving up, I just feel like I can't go any further, and God sends someone my way and gives me the, just a little encouragement. And that's all it takes for me to jump up and start running again. And I know that that's the case with you too, but we need to be there for one another to be that encouragement. Encouragement, yes, also means to encourage you towards righteousness, to change some things. It doesn't, encouragement doesn't mean just tell you to keep doing what you're doing if it's harmful to you, okay? Encouragement means to direct you towards righteousness. And it's a shame too many people take that kind of encouragement as negative, that are repulsed by it. Now, let me just ask you, if you're repulsed by someone encouraging you towards righteousness, then you've got a big heart problem to work on. But if you love the Lord and realize you're not perfect, and you realize that you need that encouragement, when someone comes along and gives you that encouragement, man, it will light your fire again. It's that little tiny spark and you'll be off to the races again. And that's what we're supposed to be. Because, hey, running this race is not an easy race. Jesus said it was going to be hard. It's a narrow road. It's difficult. But it leads to life. If you want the wide, easy path, it's available to you, but I don't recommend it. <laughs> it doesn't take you to the place that you said you want to go. That's why you're here. So I pray today. If you've not yet joined the race, you can't win the race if you don't join the race. You will come today. We're going to sing this song after we pray. If you want to be baptized in the Christ and have your sins washed away so you can run the race unencumbered by your debt of sin, be free. As our brother said this morning, be free. True freedom is found only in Christ. And run the race set before you. It's all stands, we pray. God, I thank you, Lord, for opportunity to be here this morning. And God, you've encouraged us. You've corrected us. God, I pray you've worked on our heart today. You've let us know each of us has more we can do to be an encouragement. Each of us has a way to be encouraging just in our, in our demonstrated faithfulness. In our presence, God. So we can be there for one another. And bear one another's burdens. And share one another's joys. Thank you for what the church is. God, I was just talking to somebody this week about if it were not for you, if it were not for Jesus, if it were not for the body of Christ, if it were not for the hope that we have in Christ and that shared hope we have as a church, I don't know what I would do. I couldn't live life. I couldn't take all of the, the, the bad news that's constantly out there. I couldn't take all the heartache and, and the pain and the disappointment that happens in the world if it were not for the hope, the shared hope that we have in Christ. If it were not for the, the bride of Christ and being part of that, looking forward to the great wedding day, I, I wouldn't be able to go one more day. But God, I'm thankful that as we read today that my heart has been washed, sprinkled from an evil conscience and my body's washed with pure water. water. God, I pray for someone here today who still needs to have that good conscience, to have that washed away, God, they would come to you, Lord. They would come and give their life to you, have their sins washed away, and run the race with us together, and we can cheerlead one another on. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.